Welcome back, my friends. Today, we'll be resuming where we left off. Previously, we discussed the fundamentals of aetherology and physical empowerment. Understanding these two principles is essential for pushing past normal limits and setting oneself apart from the crowd. But starting today, things will begin to get complicated. For you see, the world of magic and spellcraft is vast, and given the almost limitless potential of Aether, there are phenomenal things one can accomplish when they apply themselves. So, today let's unravel the mysteries of magic and look upon its broad horizon. Magic, by its very definition, is Aether that is being unnaturally manipulated. So, it doesn't matter if the power is coming from a person, monster, or void scent. If Aether is willfully being turned into a state that it wasn't previously, that's magic. Now, the term unnaturally manipulated may sound negative on first glance, but honestly, almost everything in our day-to-day -day lives are similar. Unnatural things happen all the time. I bring attention to this simple fact so that people might begin to understand. And once you accept this truth, magic simply becomes another tool. Like the sword in your hand, armor on your body, or home that you reside in, magic is available to make your life or your survival that much easier. This is the reason civilizations like those in Eorzea aren't as technologically developed as, say, the Garlean Empire. For generations, magic has already been filling the needs that technology would, so there was no real reason for a civilization to rush toward the next great invention. Now that we've addressed the definition of magic, what about the aether it requires? It's sad to say, but nothing in reality is free. Even the air you breathe comes at the cost of your lungs. Plants require the sun, predators need game to hunt, and likewise, magic makes a demand of aether with every use. So, what's the price of magic and how do we pay it? In the simplest of terms, the more powerful a spell or ritual is, the more aether that will be required. That may seem obvious, but it gets complicated when you're trying to gather the aether for said cost. There are two ways of paying this fee. The aether within, which is your personal pool of aether, and the aether without, which is defined as ambient aether. We'll begin with one's personal source of power. Over the course of your life, your personal pool of aether will naturally increase before experiencing a sharp decline as you begin to reach the end of your lifespan. Although, that's only how your aether naturally behaves over the course of your life. It's entirely possible to increase the amount of personal aether you have through rigorous training and different experiences. For example, a highly skilled archmage could have more aether in their singular body than an entire town of common folk that never use magic. However, no one person has an infinite pool of aether, and if said archmage was made to fight long enough, they would eventually become exhausted. And as stated many times before, if this pool is completely spent, your life ends then and there. So, it's important to understand your limits. Rest is necessary in allowing your body the chance to replenish your aether back to its maximum capacity. And indeed, your aether will replenish given time. So long as you're not using your own life force to cast spells, that is. But we'll cover that later. The second way to pay the cost of magic is ambient aether, or rather, the energy that simply exists within our world. Remember, aether exists in everything, and as such, it can be tapped into. Normally, drawing upon ambient aether isn't that bad. Much like how your body will recover its own aether as you rest, the ambient aether in a region will return to normal given time. It only becomes a problem when ambient aether is being constantly spent and never given a chance to recover. This was the mistake made during the War of the Magi. The White Mages of Amdapur and the Black Mages of Mach were using ambient aether excessively for dozens of years. This caused the ambient aether within Eorzea to become incredibly unstable, allowing the ruin of the Six Armbal Calamity 
to wash over our entire world. Likewise, primals are dangerous no matter how they're summoned because their continued existence causes a constant drain on ambient aether. This is why the use of ambient aether is considered taboo to some magic schools, like red magic. Though, a red mage is living proof that you don't need ambient aether to become a powerful spellcaster. It simply comes in handy when trying to cast spells on a much higher scale. So, by understanding the amount of personal aether you possess, as well as the aether surrounding you, you'll always have the power required to cast spells and use magic. Which means we can move on to channeling. Spells can be cast in a variety of ways, each with their own quirks, pros, and cons. However, the most common requirement of each spell school is some kind of focus to channel your aether through. Think of it like a refining process. Without a focus, the aether you're using is more likely to be messy or unpredictable. Spells on a smaller scale don't need a focus because they use so little power or aren't trying to be used with great precision. But, magic that reaches much higher levels requires something to keep the spell's nature in check. For example, black and white mages use their staves as focusing lenses to refine their power. Meanwhile, summoners and scholars have books filled to the brim with arcane symbols that act as rules for their aether to follow. However, there are cases in which one's body can become their spell focus. Though this is harder than it sounds and usually doesn't allow spells on a larger scale to be cast easily, if at all. For instance, Dark Knights do this by burning their personal pool of aether like a black flame, allowing them to cast spells without outside help. Suffice to say, some form of focus is required to gain a mastery of magic. It's up to you what form that focus takes and how far you're willing to go to refine it. Whether it be a book, weapon, or yourself, the better quality of focus you possess, the more flexibility you have when casting spells. Finally, we'll address the basic forms that spells and magic can take. If we refer to the ethereal chart, we already have a solid understanding of what states Aether can take and how it can be shaped into something more powerful. For starters, you've the six elements. Lightning, fire, earth, ice, water, and wind. It doesn't take an incredible amount of imagination to already start picturing what kinds of spells you can create by shaping your aether into any of these elements. A raging flame, a twisting tornado, a torrential flood, or spears of ice. These are basic applications of elemental magic. However, the most powerful mages never focus on just one element. Allow me to explain. Let's say someone chooses to specialize in elemental ice, a cryomancer if you will. They could become decently powerful, with a distinct advantage against anyone who wields elemental wind. However, our cryomancer would likely lose to anything that uses elemental fire since ice is naturally weak against it. It's important to understand these elements and what they can do for you. Make sure to experiment as different combinations can create different results. With experimentation comes an understanding of the astral and umbral alignments. Astral represents energy in an active state. Meanwhile, umbral refers to energy within a static state. Both of these polarities can be applied to the elements for various effects. Using our earlier Cryomancer as an example, Astral Ice would resemble a wild blizzard. Meanwhile, Umbral Ice would be more static and take the form of an unchanging glacier. This applies similarly to the other elements. A hurricane versus stagnant air. A torrential wave versus a still lake. And so on and so forth. For the longest time, people associated the classifications of light and darkness to astral and umbral respectfully. However, two things happened that turned this theory on its head. First is the seventh umbral calamity. Beyond any doubt, Bahamut's rampage was astrally charged, yet darkness was found permeating the land during this time. Secondly, records suggest that if an eighth umbral calamity was to occur, it would be umbrally charged. 
and all sources suggest that light would have been responsible for it. So, while astral still represents active energy, and umbral still represents static energy, many scholars don't know exactly where light and darkness fit in this equation anymore. But, new theories suggest that darkness is more astral, and that light is more umbral. Though, I'm not here to redraw the etheric chart. Yet. So, let's leave it at this. When it comes to light and darkness, we clearly still have much more to learn. And by extension, we've more to learn about magic as well. Mayhaps the chart is flawed, and will needs be updated someday. But not today. And that, my curious listeners, will be the end of my second lesson on Aether. Now, you not only understand how Aether can empower your physical body, but the principles of channeling magic, the states it can take, and the inevitable cost. My next lesson on Aether will be on the various spell schools and magic types that have been created over the years. The six elements, astral and umbral, darkness and light, all these things brought together create the foundation of amazing spells. And I'm not just talking about throwing elements around. Creating weapons out of magic that you can hold. Conjuring illusions, controlling gravity, healing those that might yet be saved from death's embrace. All of this and more is possible within the spell schools we'll discuss next time. So, until then, I hope you all remain well, remain curious, and stay safe, my friends. If you like this video, don't forget to like and subscribe. Big shout out to my patrons, Rovacus, Monsolo97, Potato, Runatir, The Yellow Couch, Sage Mouse. Papaya Cyan, and Vavala Soma. If you want to see more lore content in the future, share this with your friends. My dream is to share as much as I find with as many people as possible. And if you do end up helping me, thank you so much in advance. And have a wonderful day.